Hello and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the office of the Phi Beta Kappa Society in Washington, DC. My guest today is Robert Wilson, editor of The American Scholar, the journal published by Phi Beta Kappa. Robert Wilson is the author of the recent biography, Matthew Brady, Portraits of a Nation. Robert Wilson, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thanks so much for having me. Matthew Brady is considered by many people as the quintessential 19th century American photographer, if not the first great photographer in general. And I wonder if you could begin by telling us a little bit about his origins, his formative influences, what made him who he became. One of the kind of fascinating uh, challenges of doing this book was that so little is known about Brady. He was a man who was in the public eye for 50 years, and yet is kind of a blank slate in many ways. He was not somebody who uh, left journals or diaries or wrote a lot of letters, and even his business um, communications were minimal. So there, we don't really know a huge amount about his origins. He, he came from upstate New York. Um, he apparently moved to New York as a very young man, probably about the age of 16. I think like many people who come from the country, he lived on a farm. His parents were Irish immigrants. Mm -hmm. And many, like many people who go to the big city from the country, you know, he was completely taken with the city and city life. Uh, and, and really fell into the energy of the city uh, as a very young man. I know he had an entrepreneurial streak, but one thing that struck me from your book was you, you mentioned the fact that as a boy he had severe eye problems, yes. which is quite interesting given that he went on to become a photographer, and I wonder if in fact that might have been, I mean again, can you, do you feel inclined to psychologize? Do you think that might have been part of what propelled him into an area that would enhance sight? He said late in life, um, you know, to a friend, isn't it interesting that that lack of, that absence of light sort of drove me to the light? Mm -hmm. And so he definitely thought about that himself. Um, I think, you know, he had, he had been uh, associated with a painter while he was still in upstate New York. And when he went to New York, he looked him up, and this painter was in the sphere of, of Samuel Morse, who was, of course, a, a famous portrait painter as well as the inventor of the telegraph. And so Brady was kind of at the fringes of artistic circles in New York at the time that photography was coming along. So I think partly it was, it was also just timing and, and kind of being in the right place at the right time. He seemed to have a, a feeling for the chance or for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed also that you mentioned Samuel Morse and he knew Morse, he had contact with Morse who was, as you say, known for his invention of the telegraph but also was a painter and a photographer. Yes. Um, and later in life it seems that Brady may have exaggerated his connection with Morse, do you think that's so for PR reasons or, or something of Well, sort? you know, a lot of the information we have about Brady comes from interviews he gave late in life. As I get a little later in life myself, I'm <laughs> sympathetic to the uh, ways in which you uh, sort of tell better and better stories about yourself as you get older. And he was definitely, I mean, that was another challenge of the book is in what little is recorded about what he said about his life he was prone to exaggeration. And, uh, but he definitely said some things about Morse that were uh, unlikely to be true. Um, he, you know, he, um, I, one of the things that fascinates me about his, his relationship with Morse was that Morse actually, among other things, ran as a nativist mayor of New York, a kind of anti-Irish, essentially, and wrote tracts against the Irish. 
So it shows a little bit of Brady's, I guess, flexibility as a businessman that he continued to take pictures of Morse and have seemingly not close, but uh, you know, amicable relations with him. That's really interesting. I mean, one thing that does come across about Brady is that he really was non-ideological. Yeah. For the purpose of getting the best subjects he could, he certainly wasn't going to be partisan on one side or the other. And even, you know, when the Civil War came along, um, you know, our most partisan moment, Brady was able, and, and Brady was, you know, from the North. All of the photographs he took were from the Northern perspective, Northern generals. Um, but the day Robert E. Lee returned from Appomattox to Richmond, Brady got him to, or he got him to agree, and he posed the next morning for him. Uh, so, you know, that, that to me speaks of, of that sort of ability to get along with everybody. Yeah, and, and it was quite time. an extraordinary coup, wasn't it, for him to get Lee to pose for him? It really was. Um, uh, Lee's, one of Lee's sons wrote later that there was nothing Lee hated so much as having his picture taken. And yet, this day he comes back, I mean, you can only imagine how Lee must have felt. Uh, completely defeated in spirit and in every other way. And Brady kind of comes over and talks to Mrs. Lee and, and he agrees to do it. And, uh, and there were, and the pictures were really quite remarkable, I think. Um, I've thought a lot in the book about why Lee had done it. And I think the timing could have been important in that Lincoln died the, the day Lee returned from Appomattox. Lee kind of wandered home from Appomattox. Mm -hmm. uh, oddly, he didn't make a beeline home. And, and so the Saturday morning, uh, Lincoln died that Saturday morning, um, and Lee agreed to be photographed that, that afternoon, and then sat on, on Easter morning for Brady. And I think it was Lee wanting to sort of put out there this image of him you know, his kind of dignity and, and, and a kind of calming influence at a time that was very frightening time for the nation. So I think that had something to do with it. I think Lee had larger matters in mind. So it wasn't simply the uh, uh, persuasive powers of Brady, perhaps. Well, probably a little He huge. would have put probably it forward that way. Yeah. I was also struck by the interesting fact that Brady established his New York photographic studio a block away from P.T. Barnum's yes. American Museum. Yes, and I wonder about that. Do you feel that um, he borrowed consciously from Barnum in some way, or do you think they had a similarity in temperament? Because certainly Brady was a master promoter. I, I don't see how he could not have been affected by Barnum. I mean, Barnum was such a big figure, even as Brady was starting out. The museum was the, uh, at that time, was the greatest uh, tourist draw in the city of New York, the American, Barnum's American Museum. Brady put a big sign on the side of his building, and Barnum's, uh, Barnum was kind of catty corner, mm -hmm. but when you came out of the Barnum Museum, if you looked straight ahead, you could see this great sign, Brady's Photographic Studio, so he was trying to capture those people as they came out a very Barnum-esque thing to do. His, his gallery of famous men, statesmen, uh, military leaders, and of course presidents, mm -hmm. quite an extraordinary collection that he was able to amass of these figures. How did this begin? How did he, and then he seems, I guess, the more people of note he, uh, he got to, to pose for him, the more people he could get. Uh, no, that's true. I mean, he understood pretty early on that, um, you know, that the way to build his own reputation was to be uh, associated with people who already had a reputation. Mm -hmm. And um, so even in the kind of mid-1840s, he had begun to take pictures of famous people. The first uh, president he took a picture of was Millard Fillmore in the White House um, in about 1848. He was down in Washington for a while. He took a picture of Dolly Madison, actually, who mm. was many years uh, removed from the White House. 
and he claimed to have taken the last picture of uh, Andrew Jackson at the Hermitage before he died, but that was not true. Uh, he, he exhibited it for many years, and uh, a number of other people have claimed to take that picture. So but, he didn't. This is the case of several he. pictures that he claimed yeah, to have taken. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but then he did uh, follow up, and in fact, very close to the end of his life, he um, was scheduled to take a picture of the sitting vice president and was hit by a a, a, a truck in a few blocks from here and uh, had to cancel the appointment. And the, that vice president was named uh, Adlai Stevenson, oh. as it happens. Oh, really? Yeah. But anyway, that, so right up until almost the very end of his life, he was had access to people like that and to first ladies. This was the father of the Adlai Stevenson, or the or grandfather? maybe the grandfather. Grandfather, yeah. 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 Would you say that the most famous photograph, well, he took many famous photographs, but the one of Abraham Lincoln directly prior to the Cooper Union Address, um, which is said to have helped catapult Lincoln into the presidency, and certainly Brady was one to support that idea. Um, how significant do you think that photograph was? Well, it was clearly used widely. I mean, it was reproduced in Harper's Weekly. It was reproduced on campaign buttons. Um, it, it, it was at about the time that carte de visite, those calling card size photographs that were, were traded and collected came out. But uh, people who really know say it was maybe a little bit too late to take advantage of that. But still, it was very widely done. Uh, there's a quote that is irresistible to anyone writing about Cooper Union or, or Lincoln at that time, in which Lincoln says, uh, Brady and the Cooper Institute, as he called it, made me president. <laughs> now, as I like to say, Brady is the only source for that quote, <laughs> so make of it what you will. It, one of the questions you raise in your book is how many or how many of the photographs Brady actually was responsible for and in what way he was responsible. In many cases, of course, he didn't take the picture himself, but I wonder if I mean, would, you, would the analogy be to a, a director of a film, for example, or would it be more like uh, the owner of a franchise? I, I think that a director is a good analogy, although he wasn't always present. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he was an absentee director, I guess. He, um, you know, his, I mean, the role of the photographer, especially in the daguerreotype era, there were so many people required, so many different skills required. It wasn't a kind of portable medium until really about the time of the Civil War. So that it, there was no reason in a way for an individual necessarily to be the guy standing behind the camera. So he was much more involved with the aesthetics of the picture, with you know getting the people, especially the famous people, to come sit. Uh, with just running the studio, with getting his name out there, with making mm. a Brady photograph a brand name. And I, I say at one point in the book that the only time we can really be sure that Brady was there for a photograph is when he's in it, which he often was. I mean, uh, late in life, especially in the, some of the Civil War photographs, he would um, pose himself kind of off to the side of a photograph. and. Uh, in, in a ways that were deeply intriguing to me. But. I found those very intriguing too. I mean, they reminded me on the one hand of the way Renaissance patrons would have themselves painted into the mm -hmm. corner of a painting, but they also reminded me of Hitchcock's cameo appearances right, right, in his right, films. Right. And I wonder, yeah, what do you make of this? Was this a kind of self-reflexivity? Was it a desire to show that this was his photograph? Or was it just the idea of being present at a historical moment? You know, there was a lot of dis dispute, a lot of disputing about copyright um, at, at about that time. So, I mean, if he was in a picture, then the, there would be no copyright problems. They, they co freely copied one another's photographs. And uh, he, um, but I think that in some places, he really had an idea about why he was putting himself there, especially Gettysburg. He came late to Gettysburg. His former employee and now rival, Alexander Gardner, had gotten there and taken the dramatic photographs of the dead, who were really mostly buried by the time Brady got there. So Brady, Brady did what I think 
is quite deliberately a very interesting thing. He posed himself looking at the now sort of placid places where the battles had taken place. Mm. And to me, what you see for really the first time in photography is this um, really strong argument that a photographer makes a photograph, which was not often accepted. It was generally said that the sun created photographs, <laughs> you know, that it was an objective mechanical medium. So I think to some extent he was saying that, but he was also inviting the reader in to see here's a person contemplating a scene. And um, I really do believe that's what he was doing there. I mean, it was also, I mean, there was, it was good PR. It was saying to people, if you get a photo by Brady, then Brady is there, as he often was not. But I, I feel like there are three photographs from Gettysburg where he puts himself in the exact same position vis-a-vis -vis the camera, and you're, you are quite literally looking over his shoulder. You see his back. So he's your surrogate. Uh, Yes. seeing what and, is there. Yeah, and he's also <clears throat> insisting on the, the, the role of a human sensibility in the making of a photograph, I think. And, um, so the beginning of art photography, in a sense. At that I think potential. so. I mean, I say, you know, if we look at Gardner's pictures from Gettysburg, we think, oh, these are so historically significant. They're so yeah. sad. And, but the, and we're not much moved by Brady's in a way, but I think there's a great deal more content to them. Mm. Um, and so that's, that was one of the things that I found really most interesting in, in all my years on this book. Well, the, the whole issue of the battlefield, the battlefield photography is so interesting. It does seem that Brady was present at Antietam and was traumatized by what he saw there and I don't think ever again was at the presence of a battle or perhaps none of the photographers were actually. He was at Bull Run. He was? Yeah, the first, the first battle he went to, uh, it was the first big battle at Bull Run. And um, he seemed very deliberately to stay away from battlefields for quite a while after that. Mm -hmm. He did not go to Antietam. Um, Gardner and and uh, James Gibson were there working for Brady at Antietam. He kind of went uh, in the general vicinity of, of Antietam a couple of weeks later. And then he, that's sort of what he did at Gettysburg too. He waited, although the New York draft riots were happening in New York at the time, he might have been in, uh, in Gettysburg. So he probably had a good excuse for staying in New York at that time. So there was a natural reticence, perhaps, about confronting this. I mean, it's very hard to understand because the New York newspaper world was such a competitive world, and you would have thought the, you know, that the editors were just saying, "Get me some blood and guts." And and but there was the interests were often more sociological. I mean, they were things like men cooking on a campfire mm. or doing their wash or bathing in the river or and um, it's hard to I mean it's very it's very puzzling I mean even at the end of the war all the photographers rushed, rushed to Richmond which had burned as after the Confederates abandoned Richmond so they're all there merrily taking pictures of burned buildings there's nobody at Appomattox mm. you know when Lee and Grant met on this incredibly dramatic morning no photographers present, yeah. you know, and uh, so there was this just odd, our, our sensibility about what, what is interesting maybe was just not theirs. I was struck the famous incident that you mentioned, the scandal that was uncovered in 1970 when Alexander Gardner was shown to have moved bodies that he had photographed for the purpose of photographing them in, I guess, a more aesthetically pleasing uh, configuration that caused a scandal. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and whether you think that Brady, uh, at this point Alexander Gardner had gone off on his own, he right. wasn't associated with Brady, but do you think this is the sort of thing that Brady did and certainly the posing of some of his subjects? Uh, they often look like they're not posed, but I wonder if you think they were. I think that it's this one instance of a body being moved. Uh, this is a famous photograph called uh, uh, Home of a Rebel Sharpshooter. Mm. Um, 
really has become in the public mind an example, you know, that for many such instances, there are very few even photographs of dead bodies in the, taken in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, William Frasinito, who's the great expert on Civil War photography, counts seven different times in the whole war when, when photographs were made of dead bodies. I mean, there were many photographs sometimes made at a time. But, and um, Brady was guilty when he came of getting one of his men to get down on his back, but he kind of had his knees up and his arms out and he was the least dead looking person you've ever seen. But Brady's caption then was um, a dead soldier, something like that. Uh -huh. Brady, I feel quite sure, never moved a body. I don't think Gardner did. I mean, people that I respect who- You don't think Gardner did? Beyond, the, beyond this that time. Oh. Um, the pe people I respect who think a lot about this uh, 19th century photographer, curators and like say, Look, they were just trying. I mean, there weren't firm rules then. I mean, they were feeling their way. Mm. And he was trying to create a narrative. You know, he, he had this narrative in mind. I mean, it is true, wouldn't you agree, that Brady's compositions were beautiful. Now, was this his gift? Um, I mean, obviously, even if he posed his subjects, there, it, it, took a, it took a certain amount of talent to decide where people should be placed. But do you think that he was always posing his generals and his statesmen uh, when they were on the site, for example? Oh, yeah. I mean, the pictures are clearly posed. I mean, one of the things I say is that he was really always a portrait photographer. Mm. And even when he went outside, he was really taking portrait photographs, <laughs> studio photographs out of doors, essentially. And um, no, I mean, the pictures are um, clearly uh, posed, and I think he did have a gift for that. I mean, early on, you can see the influence of portrait painting in in the kinds of um, objects he had people posing with, you know, columns and drapery. Mm. And, and um, but I think he did have an eye. Yeah. And and it's very interesting because Frasinito, in spite of what I said earlier about you don't really know when Brady was there or not. There is something. There are times when you know Brady had arrived after his other his guys had been taking photographs and the photographs changed dramatically yeah. they were much more interested in sort of scenery landscapes when Brady got there there were these very carefully composed pictures of generals and their staffs so after the war though his fortunes declined precipitously mm -hmm. and i wonder how you account was this a matter of his own losing traction in some way, or do you think it was changing tastes and times and so forth? What, what, why is it that he, he just lost his moxie or whatever? Yeah, he had, he had um, I mean, he was certainly overextended during the war. And he, you know, there, there are accounts saying that he was swindled by people in both his Washington and New York offices. When he was one place, he was being swindled mm. in the other. He did set a lot of store by uh, the value of the Civil War photographs, rightly so, as we know. But he had trouble selling them. There was about there. There was almost a big deal with the New York Historical Society, and then it fell through. He tried desperately to sell them to uh, the federal government, and eventually, in the mid 70s, 1870s sold them for $25,000. Although late in life, he claimed that the congressman who had introduced the bill got a gratuity of 50%. Oh. <laughs> I know something about that congressman. It was uh, Benjamin Beast Butler. Uh, and I know other things about him that lead me to believe that, that was, was probably true. <laughs> true. Uh, but so Brady's finances really, and I think it was, it was also alcohol. Uh, there were a whole lot of things that, that came into play. Um, he, you know, he, as I say, he was this farm boy, went to the city. Within a decade, he was, you know, photographing presidents. Famous people came to him to be photographed. The, uh, you know, the uh, crown prince, when he came to New York on a famous visit to the Americas, um, 
uh, went immediately to Brady's studio to be photographed. An extraordinary rise to fame. Yeah, yeah. so I, you know, you feel about people like that sometimes that they, ultimately, they can't accept it. You know, yeah. and ultimately yeah. they destroy themselves in some way. And I wouldn't be surprised to a bit. I try not to psychologize too much <laughs> in the book, but I wouldn't be surprised if something like that was at work as well. Well, just to sum up, because we're out of time, if I were to ask you what you think Matthew Brady's greatest contribution was to the art of photography, to American photography, what would you say? Gary Wills kindly read my book and gave a, a, a quote about it, and he said, Matthew Brady did not just make photographs, he made photography. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the various ways in which he did it. I mean, as a collector, as an innovator, uh, as a person who was very interested in the technology, uh, as a person who knew how to get his name around, and as a photographer in the sense in which we think of one. So, yeah, I think he was crucial to American photography in the 19th century. Well, I want to thank you, Robert Wilson, for talking to us about Matthew Brady. Thank you so much, Paula. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview. Mm -hmm.